<laughs> today, <laughs> thank everybody for coming. It's lovely to see everybody, even if it's just your pictures. Today, Mike's going to give us a talk. Mike Fulliston from Seven is giving us a talk on marine images and the and he does love taking pictures and he's got some wonderful ones to show us. And um, before we start, and I'll hand over to him, I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction. Mike is a retired mentor, has a lifelong interest in the marine environment. He's been an associate member of the MBA for nine years and a volunteer for the last three years, engaged in Barnacle ID for the Mar Klim project. Maybe some of you will remember he gave us a talk about barnacles last term. Mike is a co-founder of the Shores of South Devon, which is a Facebook group. Um, interest group, which was started in January this year. He has a passionate interest in recording and photographing marine intertidal species with a particular interest in cirripedia, which is barnacles, as you might remember, and algae and periphera, which is sponges, and bryozoa and acidia, which he's going to tell us all about, hopefully. Apart from spending as much time on the shore as he can, Mike is a busy environment and climate change campaigner. So now I'm going to hand over to Mike. Yes, thanks, Jan, for the uh, very kind introduction there. Um, thanks very much. Can I just point out, actually, that Shores South Devon actually are now a marine interest group, and um, we are based in Timworth mainly. So uh, we have branched out somewhat from the, uh, the Facebook page. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming this morning. Um, so this morning I'm going to share some slides um, called Intertidal Marine Images, the Inspiration and Stories Behind Them. So as Jan uh, introduced me, I, I spent a lot of time on the shore uh, recording and taking um, marine species, uh, taking pictures of marine species. And it occurred to me that while I'm out there, um, I've had some quite interesting experiences. Um, you know, falling into the water, getting boots full of water, get my waders full of water, um, breaking things on the shore. And I thought, actually, it might be kind of useful just to kind of, and entertaining, perhaps, just to kind of talk about that. So, um, moving swiftly on, uh, the, the first slide actually shows the uh, north end of Goodrington Beach, which is at, which is at Paynton. And... It's the most wonderful beach and shore, actually. Um, so in the background here, we have Berry Head and we have Brixham. Uh, this is obviously Tor Bay. Uh, this whole coastline is really diverse, actually. Uh, behind here, we have a place called um, Salton Cove, which is an incredibly diverse uh, site. The reason I'm showing this picture is if you look carefully, you can see in the foreground, this kind of pile of stuff. In fact, this pile of stuff actually was incredibly smelly which made me kind of go and investigate. And when I looked, I was amazed and somewhat surprised to find piles of thousand upon thousand of solitary sea squirts that it looks like they have been there for a few days. Um, so, the, so looking at this picture, what I can see is mainly these two species, which are uh, um, Acidiella uh, scabra and Acidiella aspersa. And these are very both both of these species are very common um, subtidal species. They're also found on the shore to some extent. Um, so I was rather intrigued to see them there. And they, it was quite fascinating, actually. And I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering if anybody else watching this today has had has found similar kind of find. So I'm still curious why they turned up in a, a big pile. Um, okay, so Quite nearby this, this uh, site is Preston Sands Beach on Paynton Seafront. And I took this picture um, <clears throat> last December, actually. And this is quite a good beach to find up washed up marine litter. Uh, often it's colonized, so I, I always get quite excited by that. So this was uh, middle of December last year. It was a really quite cold, very windy um, day. The sea was quite rough. And I walked along a short while and then I got quite excited because I found a uh, lobster cage. And, um, and oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and I, I, I actually then 
I was only wearing my boots, so I actually then kind of went into the water, quickly filled my boots full of cold water, retrieved the, uh, the, the, the pot and took it onto the shore, as you can see. And to my amazement, the inside there was a, a rather decent sized lobster and a good sized edible eating crab. So I took them out and there they are. Now, the, the lobster was a little bit beaten up. It lost a few um, back legs, um, but it's very much alive. And same with the crab. The crab was pretty well preserved. So my immediate thought um, was, I want to put these animals back. Um, you know, it didn't, it didn't occur to me to eat them because I actually don't eat animals. So I thought these guys need to go back in the water, which has actually proved to be quite a difficult task. So I, um, I eventually went out into the water over the top of my boots, completely soaked, freezing cold, and put the lobster into the water. And amazingly, it swam off into the surf, <laughs> which was quite impressive considering it actually lost some legs. So uh, it went off quite happily. So I was quite pleased about that. And then I had the crab. So I then scoured the beach behind me and there were some shallow sand pools. I put it in there, but it kept getting kind of, it didn't like it there. I put it into the surf, it kept getting washed in. I thought, well, what am I going to do here? So the nearest place on deep water actually was about a 10 minute walk up the end of the promenade to Paynton Harbour. And I walked up carrying this crab in my hands in the rain. And then I dropped it down the side of the, the harbour wall and it swam, I watched it swam the clear water, it swam to the bottom. So it was an, it was an interesting experience. Um, so that's my that's my bit for marine conservation. I think uh, I saved two two wonderful animals there and got soaked. Um, so the next bit, uh, next slide rather, is so this is a line of rocks that stretch out from um, East Cliff, which is actually at Timmouth. So it's Timmouth Town Beach. Um, Immediately above this spot actually is Timothy Yacht Club where we we put on some talks for Shores of South Devon. So the reason I'm showing this line of rocks is is a lot of the time they don't look particularly um, exciting. Uh, although I tend to look at the they are quite well colonized with barnacles or limpets, so I do tend to have a look at them. And the reason I'm showing it, as I said, is just to show you what they look like um, with a, a lower tide. Now this picture here actually was taken uh, on my birthday in the middle of August, and it was a neat it was a neat tide. So I was out on the beach, did a bit of swimming, <clears throat> and there wasn't very much to look at uh, initially um, to explore. Um, I saw some of these rocks just sticking out the water. They're quite smooth, actually, as you can see. So I was there in my swimming gear and. Uh, and it was a nice sunny day and I, I put the camera under the water and messed around and I realized actually it, it was quite intriguing. I was seeing quite a lot of activity. I was, seeing, I was seeing limpets rising up and walking around. I was seeing limpets fighting. I was seeing the barnacles starting to feed and uh, I, I was there for about 30 minutes actually bending over in the water, looking into the water rather, getting some quite strange looks but that, that's not unusual. Mm -hmm. and. Apart from getting an aching back, actually, it was it was absolutely amazing because I just saw so much uh, life on this seemingly uninteresting rock, uh, rocks rather. And what made my day was I saw two two juvenile uh, Montague blennies. Um, this is one of them. I managed to luckily I managed to capture a, a, an image and. Uh, this is quite a small fish, actually, you can see it relative to the barnacles. And they were skipping round in the water. Uh, yeah, I was looking into the water, they were skipping round in front of me. And it was just amazing. They were so, they were just so beautiful. Um, as you can see, it's got the bright blue spots, which is indicative of uh, Montagues. And uh, it's just fantastic to see it. And then I managed to capture this picture of a a common, um, it was a common uh, limpet, but you can see it's very heavily colonized here with um, 
uh, barnacles, uh, I think mainly Austraminius here, which are incredibly uh, numerous uh, around this area. And uh, this, got, this one was actually rising up because nearby, I didn't catch the two together, but nearby there was another limpet and they were basically rising up, having a competitive kind of strap really. And uh, yeah, it just made it just made great watching. It was really quite mesmerizing watching this activity under the water. Ah, so I'm jumping back now uh, a couple of years. Uh, I think it was August 2018. So uh, what we have here is uh, two. You probably recognise them. Two strawberry and enemies locked in locked in mortal combat. So they, uh, I saw this actually uh, on a day I was down at the uh, MBA and luckily right below the MBA laboratory there is the most amazing shore, the hoe, the hoe foreshore. And the bit below actually is very rich in anemones and, um, and sea squirts and all kinds of things. So I, I, I went down there for an hour or two each time I went to the MBA for Tiber's OK. And on this particular day, it was quite a sunny day. The water was quite ripply. And I looked into the water and then I saw these two. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. So um, I, I watched them for a while and they were carrying on locked together, the tentacles waving about, because uh, you probably know that strawberries are quite, uh, quite aggressive kind of animals to each other. They're very competitive for uh, space. So I potted around and I came back to look at them again about five minutes later or something. And then to my amazement, I noticed this. In the middle of the two fighting anemones uh, was a big plump uh, uh, grey um, slug, which are quite, you know, they're fairly common. Um, now, the only thing I can think of is, is that I, I did actually turn a stone over quite near the two enemies and then I wander off somewhere else. I think what may have happened was the slug was underneath the stone and then it came around and for some reason decided to, to kind of jump in the middle of the two enemies. Uh, at one point, the slug got completely engulfed and it disappeared. Now, most of you on here will probably know that it's actually the slug that is actually the, uh, the predator. Uh, they will they will munch into a, a nice anemone. So I saw this this guy in there, um, in mix of all tentacles, and then I watched in amazement for about I think about five minutes actually. And then you can see the uh, anemone start. Uh, sorry, the slug is starting to come out, and it slowly kind of moved out of the two, the, the tentacles, and then it gradually kind of moved away as you can see, and then there it is kind of wandering off basically. And you can see the tentacles on the, uh, on the strawberry anemones have kind of retracted. So uh, it, was, it was just an amazing kind of show. Uh, you know, I think it kind of illustrates that you never know what you're going to see if you just spend any time staring into the water. Uh, in a, in a pool or, or on a beach or, or, or wherever. So I've never seen anything quite like it again, um, but you never know, do you? So, um, and interestingly, the tide came in and then the, the two, uh, I haven't got pictures of this, but the two anemones actually then separated and then they retracted their tentacles. Uh, it, was, it was most amazing, they actually moved apart. I actually saw them move apart. It was most amazing. Um, so fighting anemones. Now, this is a, I'm moving back again to uh, Goodrington Beach, where I showed earlier, the same kind of area. I'm showing this pool uh, because it, it is quite a distinctive rock pool. Uh, the shape of it is actually very square. Um, and I, I last visited it two years ago. And I counted five species of anemones in there. And at that point, it was like uh, three, maybe even four foot deep, actually. And it had uh, hundreds and hundreds of daisy anemones around the edge. Um, in the middle, there were a couple of, uh, I think two or three, actually, quite large dahlia anemones. There was 
red and green beetles all scattered around. Um, there was um, there was uh, grey and, and 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 green uh, snake locks uh, all around. Uh, it was the most amazing pool, and I took lots of photos at the time. And so when I went back there recently, uh, this is back in September this year. I quickly went up to look for this pool again. I found it okay because it's quite distinctive, but uh, I hadn't actually kind of, um, you know, thought that perhaps it may not look quite the same. And when I got there, I was somewhat disappointed because it had actually been filled up with sand. And I only saw one one green snake locks. So I, yeah, I felt a bit uh, disappointed by that. And I thought, well, okay, you know, obviously I hadn't thought of that. And this is what happens because around this area, there's a lot of sound shifts. Uh, anyway, I noticed uh, I noticed this uh, flat stone here. I thought, well, okay, I'll have a look under that. Um, and I'm quite glad I did uh, because I found this rather beautiful sponge, which actually is Oscarella uh, asper. Uh, there's there's several Oscarella species. Um, they're quite difficult to differentiate actually without my microscope. And you can see it's a rather beautiful colour. Uh, they can be very variable: yellow and green, clear, all kinds of colours actually. But what I think is quite interesting here is is that I don't know if you notice, but there's some bait, there's a baked bean sea squirt here. Um, solid the solitary squirts. There's another one. There's a couple here and. There's, um, Dendrododa grows here, and the the uh, Oscarella actually has grown around the bait bean sea squirts, which I thought was amazing. Um, I so actually I should just give a little bit of kind of scale to this because um, and if you in the background you can see some pies over here. Um, so these, these guys, it was pretty small. It was quite a small patch, but very colourful. Um, um, with the help of others, I did actually identify it okay. Um, so that was, a, that was a nice find after the disappointment of the, the rock pool. Um, okay, so this, this is a fairly recent picture back in um, September. So this is at a place called uh, Gales Hill Beach in Timoth. It, it, it's, it's not a particularly exciting beach, actually. It's on the edge of the, um, between the fish key and, uh, and, and the clay docks. Uh, and it's used mainly by uh, commercial boat owners and recreational boat owners. And first glance doesn't look particularly interesting. But I noticed uh, on the top of the beach, there was, there was, pile, uh, there was quite big piles of these cages, which actually, in case you don't know, are actually cuttlefish cages. Uh, because around our way here in Torbay, uh, Paynton, there is quite a big cuttlefish industry now. Um, uh, around April, May, they put these cages out, which are quite large actually, in, in quite close into the shore. And there's, there's huge numbers of cuttlefish get caught and they're exported. So these cages were here. Now for me, um, I get quite excited when I see things like this because I know, I know on these kind of structures there's going to be lots of dried uh, barnacles, lots lots of dried uh, mollusks of all kinds. There'll be dried rhizoa, and that turned out to be the case. Actually, I did find some interesting barnacles on there. Um, some still alive, I think. Uh, so there. So if you look carefully on this picture, you see here, this is like the entrance on the cage with the cuttlefish swimming and they can't get out again. And it consists of these orange uh, plastic uh, strips. So on the next image, um, I've done a close up and you can see um, these barnacles, which actually are um, Balanus crenatus, which is a subtitled species mainly. You do find them on 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 low low tides. Um, I, I see it, it was a little bit tricky identifying them because uh, they change shape, and the reason for that is they've probably been out of the water for about four or five months. Um, so they're probably they're somewhat desiccated. They're maybe still alive. I'll take the picture because um, 
it, there was nice blue sky and sunshine behind behind and i did this close up and i just love this kind of kind of luminous quality of the orange plastic and i, I do have a fascination with um marine animals and plastic i spend a lot of time taking this kind of pictures um and barnacles particularly love love plastic i, I can assure you and saddle oysters and those kind of animals and bryozoa they actually love plastic so um i just thought this made a rather kind of unusual uh, image and i spent a, a very enjoyable hour there actually looking around this the seemingly uninteresting beach i found some quite interesting stuff um yeah, so that caught my eye. Um, next one. Ah, okay. We actually have a human being in the picture. Um, so back in uh, back in July, I managed to catch up with a guy called Warren Maguire, and um, Warren comes down from Edinburgh every year to holiday in Brixham um, with his family. He, he has family in Brixham, so he stays there. And he loves it because uh, he is a complete isopod fanatic. He's an obsessive with isopods, but he's, he's also incredibly, incredibly knowledgeable. Um, he's not a biologist by trade. He's actually a university lecturer in linguistics, believe it or not. So we've been conversing for a while on, on Facebook and email and stuff and had the odd phone call. And so we managed to meet up and it was fantastic. We, we spent like a three, four hour after, um, uh, period together and we went to Corbin Head where Warren hadn't been before. So, and I, I, I find isopods really fascinating actually. Um, I mean, I'm, my, my knowledge of them is, 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 is not great, but I can recognize a few species now. Um, and I find them fairly regularly when I'm out on short trips. So there is there is uh, there is uh, Warren scouting the scouting the area for ice pods, looking quite quite excited. I, I must add. And here is here is here is Warren at work um, peering into his sorting tray. So what he did was uh, for a couple of hours with my assistants, uh, he did lots of CB shaking and stone shaking. Um, and it was great. We found all manner of interesting, um, very small uh, organisms. Um, so there's Warren looking there, and he's quite excited here because he's found an interesting isopod, he tells me. I can't quite remember which one it was. But uh, it, it was just amazing because I just love seeing somebody so passionate, uh, you, you know, exploring ashore and focused on a very specialist kind of subject. And I think in that, those three hours I spent with Warren, I, I, I learned so much, to be honest. And it was great. It was a great time. And uh, he's a very useful guy because uh, he, um, he IDs a lot of isopod finds for me, which, I, I mean, I can get close to, but I can't get them species level a lot of the time. So that was a very nice experience. And it inspired me so much to so the next day, I went down to my uh, local estuary. I live in Newton Abbott, which is and actually very close to the wonderful Teen Estuary. And I was talking to Warren about it, and I said, do you think we'll find many isopods down there? And he said, yes, absolutely. Um, he rattled all these names of uh, isopods off me. I said, oh, OK, well, I'm going to have a look, shall I, and see what I can find. So the next day, I went down to the estuary, Oh, sorry, I, I forgot to say, actually, I jumped, I jumped the story, actually. I meant to say, actually, flipping back, on that day with Warren at Corbin Head, we did find several species of isopod. This is one I find quite regularly, I can recognise. This is a, a male um, dynamine um, bedenta. Um, and they are fairly numerous at Corbin Head, actually. Um, and they can be very colours. There's a nice green one. They can be brown and all kinds of colours. And this is one that I, I we found, and um, uh, I didn't know what it was, but uh, uh, Warren identified it for me. Um, I'm sorry, I got a list of the <laughs> species here. No, that's it. And so it, it's actually a sign, sign more day. 
John Carter, apparently. It was the most beautiful thing, and I photographed this in my specimen pot, um, bearing in mind this, this uh, isopod was about a centimetre long. So that was a new species for me, that was fantastic. So um, going back to my story, the very next day I went down to the team, um, complete with uh, bucket uh, and, and, and specimen tray. And what I didn't uh, factor in was actually it's very difficult finding isopods in an estuary. <laughs> mainly because I was turning stones over in thick mud and I was walking around it in, on the edge of the, um, the edge of the channel and it was I was sinking into the mud and I thought this is crazy what am I doing here <laughs> but I thought I'm sure this one is a pod here I'm gonna I'm gonna find one I'm gonna find one and you know what I was there for an hour and a half working quite hard shaking seaweeds turning stones over and at one point, I rang Warren. I said, I'm not finding any isopods. And he was giving me tips where to find them. And eventually, I turned the stone over, and I found this one, <laughs> which was uh, a Jara species, which I did record. I did get that far with it. But uh, Warren told me it was an Abifons espa. So that was interesting. And this, this, this isopod actually was, I think it was about one and a half millimeters across. I managed to photograph it on my extreme macro mode on my on my camera. And that was the sum total of my hour and a half spent down at the teen estuary in the mud, <laughs> shaking seaweed all that time. I found this one tiny, tiny, tiny ice pod. But you know what? I was very excited. I came back actually quite, quite happy. And I thought that was really, really interesting because I hadn't seen that before down the estuary. I normally turn a stone over and I find hundreds and hundreds of amphipods, but obviously they're extremely numerous, so uh, you're going to find them basically. Um, so I'm just flipping back again during the during the uh, time with Warren when we sorting through the tray, it was quite interesting because I normally find um, various species of um, nudibranch at this particular site. And in the tray that Warren had was this, we, we both noticed this, this time, this very black, small black speck moving around. And I thought, well, wow, okay. And when I put, managed to transfer it into my specimen pot uh, with the aid of a paintbrush, which is a great tip, by the way, I always go to the shore now with a paintbrush. And when I looked, with, and I looked at my camera on Extreme Macro, it was this really beautiful, um, Nuda branch, um, which uh, I managed with expert help to identify as Calliope uh, baluta, which I don't think is a particularly common one. Um, so this one was about, uh, I, I would say about three millimeters. Um, so that was a, a really, it made a, a good day even nicer because I found a species of slug that I've never found before. Um, I wouldn't have found it unless we'd done some CV shaking. You would never have found this thing. Um, so that, that was really cool. So um, moving on from isopods. Um, in fact, moving out of Devon, actually, this was um, last July at Gillen Ray's Beach. Um, which is one of my favorite places because uh, I don't know if some of you know it, but actually uh, the shoreline between Gillen Bay's Beach at Falmouth and Penn Dennis Point is, is, truly, is truly remarkable actually, particularly for algae. It's just so diverse from many, many species of invertebrates and, um, and, and algae in particular. Um, so I went, down, I went down last year, um, uh, partly me, Ben Holt from the Rockpool project. I've known Ben for some time now. Uh, I took, I took the, I took, I, made, I took the advantage of um, of a beautiful day. I went out onto the shore and did some swimming, and it is great because the water is always so clear at this site. And on this particular day, it was the same. And I managed to photograph, I went out with my camera and I managed to get some shots uh, of various algae. 
Um, uh, you probably you probably recognise this, but this is a, a, a canopy of Sargassum muticum, which is wireweed, uh, which is a very invasive non-native species. You probably know, but it, I think it's a very beautiful algae actually, and I'm actually uh, some people might think it's a bit old saying this, but I'm actually quite a fan of it now uh, because it is an amazing host species. Um, uh, particularly when it dies back in the winter. Uh, if you look at it very closely, as I did recently, it, it, there's all kinds of sponges and, um, and uh, other um, invertebrates growing on it, bryozoa. It's, it's a fantastic host species, um, which has been discovered more and more now. Been some research on it in the MBA over the last couple of years with students um, and interns running it. Um, it uh, Sargassum is a fantastic host for um, many species of mollusks, actually. So I'm a, I'm a fan of sargassum now, even though I sometimes get frustrated when I go to a pool and I see it, uh, I see it swamping a pool, but, you know, it's a beautiful thing, I think. So it's a nice canopy of it. And on the same day, um, I, I was looking at the harpoon weed um, which again is another non-native species, which again I think is incredibly beautiful. Um, there is actually quite a bit of it uh, at uh, Falmouth. Um, I haven't found it in my area here. I, I mean, I suppose in a way that's a good thing uh, because it's a non-native. Uh, I've looked for the last few years around Torbay. I have not found any harpoon weed, but it's a stunning, it's a stunning, uh, it's a stunning algae. And so you might know that actually there's two distinct species to this um, uh, phases, sorry, sexual phases to this species. Uh, so this is a gametrophyte uh, stage um, where it's got the harpoons, which gives it its name. Uh, there is another stage of it, which actually is main, uh, called the Falkenberg stage, which actually is more found more in northern colder waters. So I haven't seen that, where it's kind of like a pink kind of pom-pom kind of shape. So uh, a very beautiful algae. Um, right, okay, so I've got another little story to tell here. So this was um, this was at the uh, entrance almost of Paynton Harbour uh, back in uh, September. Yeah, it was a really low spring tide and a beautiful day, although a bit of a nonshore wind. But I went out, I went out and had a nice swim. Um, I went quite a way out because it's fairly shallow and flat at this site. And I came back, got my camera, and I was just having a look around, and there was just hundreds and hundreds of shells moving around beneath my feet. Uh, clearly, clearly a good population of hermit crabs. So the water was game was very clear and I looked down and then I just saw this this guy um, having a look at this tower shell, um, which I thought was slightly unusual because you don't tend to see them in these kind of shells actually. They're normally in, uh, you know, more kind of rounder shells, like dog whelk shells and that kind of thing. In fact, if you noticed, it's actually, if you can see it, it there, there, there he is and it's in a rough periwinkle shell actually. Um, so it wasn't a very big crab, it wasn't a very big shell. Uh, but I noticed it, and I watched it for a while, bending over in the water again. And, and then I, I watched it walking around, just kind of walking around, <laughs> inspecting the tower shell. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, it looks quite a big shell for me for that small crab to get in, but there we go. It was walking around it, inspecting it. I thought oh, this is this is really quite interesting, and then, uh, then after a while, it walked around it a few times, and it just thought, I can't be bothered with this really, and it kind of went back into the uh, into the sand, and again, I was still peering into the water for some reason, and it was still there just for a minute or so, and then it came back out again, but what was really more interesting was out of nowhere appeared another hermit in the more usual um, uh, dog whelk shell. 
so this one came from nowhere actually just kind of like rode across and clearly it irritated the other the other crab uh, who then as you can see like came up to it and was like kind of touching it and I thought this just could be quite interesting I just wonder if they're going to have a little bit of a kind of set to here actually fighting over the over the the rights to this big tower shell and, and that's what seemed to happen so the next part was you can see uh, you can see our friend here kind of reclaiming his his shell he's climbing over it the other the other crab is just there kind of peering out a little bit and then and then it was like uh, almost like a kind of uh, like standoff so you can see this one here is peering out got his claws ready this one here is like all ready to kind of do something and the shells in between and then <laughs> what happened was our, our friend in the rough periwinkle shell kind of went over very quickly and the with their with their claws as much as a, a hermit crab can do so they were clearly having some kind of um behavioral kind of interaction about the uh, the homing rights to the shell and then what happened was the other one disappeared very quickly and the last i saw my friend was he was he was here again inspecting the tower shell well, this time I was the water was racing in very quickly, and it became it, it became a little bit difficult to see properly. To be honest, I mean, I was still holding my camera under the water, photographing this and filming it at one point, uh, and it started to get a bit too deep, so I, I kind of left. But that was the last kind of view I had of it. So I was there for about uh, I reckon I was there for about 15, 20 minutes, believe it or not, bending over in the water and this un incoming tide watching um, hermit crabs moving around and uh, and um, kind of having a little set to where to live. So very, as you probably know, very entertaining creatures. Uh, this is probably, this is an area that, that Toby will recognize. Um, so this is uh, the western side of Coruscant Cove, which is a really lovely spot. Uh, nice beach, interesting uh, marine life there. Um, so this is actually the uh, seawall here. So this is a main line, Penzance to Paddington railway line here. And this is the seawall. This is on a very low tide, extreme low tide. And so I was able to venture around to an area that I don't often see here, which I have found some quite interesting things before. So on, the, on this particular day, um, I did find quite a few things. But for me, the, the star of the show actually was this guy, uh, which, um, as you may have recognized, is uh, now called Arch Pseudo Argus um, Doris. Um, so a basically a sea lemon. I've never seen such a colorful sea lemon. Um, I think this one was a reasonable size one. It was, a, I think it was about two or three centimeters long. I noticed it in a, in a shallow pool on a ledge. Um, and you can see the tubercles here, um, really multicolored. You can see its gills here, very brightly colored. Um, I mean, they are really quite beautiful slugs. I mean, I mean, often they are very yellow, hence the name. Um, but this particular individual, it, 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 it truly was quite stunning, actually. Um, I, I don't think I've seen one quite so colourful since. So um, that kind of inspired me. I, it just it just made my day. Actually, I went home and thought that was such a beautiful thing to see. Um, okay, you think so? This may not be quite so beautiful. Um, as I was saying earlier, actually, um, you might think this is a bit strange, but I do get quite excited when I find quite old plastic in the water because I know from experience it's usually it can be quite colonized so this is another favorite place of mine um, called Holocon Beach uh, between Torquay and Paynton it's a very very interesting site again um, very diverse I took this about 
oh yeah, this was two years ago actually, uh, in February, there's no one around. Um, it's quite, quite a windy day, the sea was a bit choppy. Um, I was only looking around and I, I saw I saw this this floating in the water. So I I thought, well, you know, because I do a lot of um, litter picking, I clean up a lot of beaches like we all do. I constantly take out uh, marine plastic litter. So I, I picked it out of the water, then put it on a on a rock and had a look at it. Um, it was actually very interesting because what I found was um, it was colonized quite heavily, actually, both pieces of plastic. Um, so <clears throat> because I'm I'm into barnacles, um, as some people might know, I was very excited because this is a this is a warm water species, Hesperana, Hesperana um, phallax. Um, uh, Hesperana phallax, sorry. Um, and I've been finding these things for about three or four years. Uh, they're very interesting species because they don't actually settle on rock, unlike most barnacles. They tend to settle on animal substrate or artificial substrates. And I know from experience now, this particular species, uh, they actually loves plastic. Um, it's actually a very small uh, species. It's a very small barnacle and can be tricky to identify. I've had this verified. Um, I mean, I think these were probably um, only about three or four um, millimeters across, actually. So on this uh, yellow piece of plastic, you can see the, the barnacles and you can see in the background some electropolosa, which is, uh, as you probably know, very common uh, frosty sea mat, is the common name, rhizoa. Uh, now, what happened here was, uh, this was quite exciting, because what I did was the tide was starting to come in and it got a bit hairy, so I had to keep moving. But what I did was I wanted some under, underwater photographs of the barnacles, and I thought that maybe if I'm really lucky, if I put, these, if I put the, the plastic and the barnacles uh, in some water, they might do something. And what I did was I, got, I put some of the plastic in there in a pool, I couldn't find any deep pools. I could only find some shallow pools, and I weighted them down with stones. And then, to my amazement, I managed to get a couple of shots of the Hespera balanas feeding. I, I've actually scoured the uh, internet since. I haven't actually found any in images of this particular species um, feeding. So you can see the cirri here, actually, the feeding arms kind of unfurling. You see the operculum here actually um, open up, obviously. And this is actually a very small barnacle. I, I found quite a lot of them since. They are very common, uh, tend to be very common on lobster cages. If you see lobster cages or crab cages, there's plastic parts on a, on a fish key, have a look. You might find them. So this is a really quite an interesting day for me. I um, It worked. And, uh, I, you know, I managed to get an image that, that I, I don't know if other people have captured very easily. So I was really quite excited about it. And then of course, you know, uh, I had the, the plastic, and as you can see in this quite old piece that is quite heavily colonized. You've got the barn the, the same barnacle, Hesper Bellanus phallax again. You've got some netted dog whale uh, eggs here. Uh, you can see Bryzoa, you can see various kind of algae around. There was other stuff as well, the saddle oysters, I remember correctly. Um, this is maybe a slightly controversial part of the talk. Uh, it left me with a huge dilemma because I picked this plastic out, it was covered in animals, and I have to say, I had a real moment. I stood on the shore looking at this plastic, all these animals, and I thought, well, what do I do? And you may or may not agree, but I actually put the plastic back into the water, which is something I don't normally do. And I've spoken to many people about this instance since, and I've had quite quite a big response to it. It's quite, some people get very upset by that actually, but it kind of raises the issue a little bit of about what you do when you find marine litter that is heavily colonized. Um, so on that particular occasion, I put it back, but it, it, was a, it was a most strange experience standing on the shore, deserted shore with all these animals and I thought they were beautiful and quite unusual barnacles. I thought, you know, they can live basically. 
So continuing the plastic theme, you may think I'm a little bit obsessed with plastic, but this was actually two years ago uh, near Paynton Harbour again, um, Preston Sands Beach. It is a fantastic beach uh, after a storm, actually, because you get, you get a lot of stuff washed up. Um, and on this occasion, uh, it was this, this kind of large um, container, as you can see, which when I felt, it was literally standing there like that on the beach. Um, uh, it was quite a rough day, uh, been storm, very big, big seas the next, the, the preceding days. And I looked at this and I thought, oh, this looks quite interesting. It's also been in the water for a while. So I looked inside and indeed, um, so there was a couple of goose barnacles, which um, are beautiful. Um, and there was bryzoa, um, uh, in there, there was other, st there was various algae. Um, uh, I think it was Steve Trevella told me actually that this bryzo he reckons was non-native. He said there was a few non-native species on this particular container, so that was interesting. I don't know what they are actually, um, but it, it was uh, such a beautiful thing to look through into the container and you see all the all this life in there again. Um, so this is the most common uh, barnac goose barnacle you're going to find, the Lepas antifera, which is the one that you find on logs and, and, and crates and all kinds of things in the thousands sometimes. Uh, and I took another picture, um, which is actually inside the container. So this is a serpular worm, again, which I think Steve might have said might be a non-native species. And if you look, it's very beautiful. And if you look again uh, here, you can see um, a tiny, tiny jellyfish. So this this is some kind of hydromedusa um, species. It was minute, and I, I didn't even realise I photographed it. Actually, I got home and looked at the images. So all this is on the plastic on this plastic container. So it was it was amazing. Um, okay. Um, what I've done is I've put in a few pictures of um, of, of individuals spe uh, of species that I thought were quite unique. Um, so I don't know if you recognise what this is, but this is actually um, 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 <clears throat> Botryloides leachy, um, a city in sea squirt. Um, I, I know that because if you look at it, you can see like a double row of zoids here. Um, and you can see here is actually the exhalant um, siphons. So um, th there were various colonies of the most beautiful um, 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 Betrillus and um, Leachy um, colonies I've ever seen. And this particular one, I've never seen since, or so, uh, actually, uh, it's very interesting because the coloration, as you can see, is very unusual. And if you notice here, uh, this is actually pseudo betrillus um, markings. So on a, on a, a betrillus uh, star residian, you would normally have a, a cloaca opening here. You would have a hoe, which is a shared opening, but there isn't one. So sometimes, in fact, this is very unusual. You can get um, this species, um, Botryloide species, with like pseudo markings. Um, so it, it, it wasn't that big. Um, find a couple of patches of it. It is, I think it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen, to be honest, and that's why I have included it today. Um, okay, going back, slug time. Um, I've actually found a couple of these. Um, so this species actually is Pleurobranchus um, membranchius. Um, it's actually quite large. Um, you can see I put a 10p piece there. Uh, so I found this about two years ago at uh, Shoulder Nest Beach uh, near Timoth. And I found it um, just lying on, on a rock, actually. The tide had just gone out and it, is, it was lying on a rock. So um, it was quite large uh, and, and most incredible, beautiful thing. And what I did was after I photographed it in a pot and stuff, I put it in a pool of water and uh, there it is, uh, opened up. Um, I've actually um, put it on onto onto um, the Nudibranch page on Facebook before, 
Um, people have said they, they feel very envious and never found one of these. Uh, apparently, they're not that common to find. Um, I have found another one since. But it was the mo most incredible uh, thing to see uh, under the water. And what was incredible was I, I eventually um, took it out again and I put it into the deeper water and it swam off at a rate of knots. And I, I read up subsequently that they are incredible swimmers. And I actually witnessed that. So that, that was a really nice thing. Hmm. So back to algae. Um, this is actually quite a scarce species. Um, and I, I found this about a year ago at Corbin Head, which is on Torquay Seafront. It's my favorite my favorite marine site actually. It's very accessible, so it does get a bit damaged by, by people sometimes, unfortunately. But on a low tide, it, it, it's absolutely incredibly diverse. So this species actually is Solaria, uh, so Solaria cordalis. Or uh, if you look in the uh, Sea Search Seaweed book uh, by Bunker, the Solier's red stringweed. And the reason I've included it is because it is the most incredible colour. It, it really is quite bright red and it's stunning to see it underwater or actually out of water. And this was actually out of water. And somehow I, I managed to produce a slightly kind of ethereal kind of image because what happened was on the day I took this picture, um, it was really a heavy drizzle, which was quite annoying. And so the mist kept the, the, the lens kept misting up and it's created this kind of strange misty effect <laughs> while you can still see the algae. Um, and there it is close up again. Um, it, it's a stunning thing to see. It really is bright red. So a beautiful, beautiful algae and algae and it's still plenty of it out there at, uh, at Corbin Head in, in the shop. And then and then the shallow subtitle actually, um, it, it, it's mainly subtitle species. So I guess look out for it um, up your neck of the woods. Um, you might you never know? You might see it around somewhere. So um, okay, some barnacles. Uh, what we're actually looking at here, what I'm interested in here, is a species that I recently been finding. Now I've got an eye for it. So this these green blobs basically. There's a blue-green algae, um, uh, Sinai species, so it's Rivularia bellata. Uh, maybe I haven't noticed it before because it's basically little green blobs on, 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 on rocks. They, they have an affinity for some reason with, um, with barnacles. Uh, essentially what it is, it's a gelatinous mass and inside you have the bacteria inside, inside these blobs. Um, I didn't know about it until recently, actually, when I can't remember, it was Dave, it was Dave Fenwick who actually put a picture up on, uh, and I noticed it. And I thought, that's, I'm sure I've seen that somewhere. And then, but it was just such a coincidence about a week later, this was taken at Ansys Cove in Torquay, which is an amazing site again. I, I saw, I, I found this rock and it was covered in, in these little green blobs. And because I've been looking at Dave's pictures, I recognised it straight away as Rivularia um, bellata. So basically, it's not an algae, it's actually a uh, bacteria. It's a blue green uh, bacteria. Quite an amazing thing. And to follow on from this, it's taken about a week ago at Ferry, a place called Ferry Cove, which is a, a nice place, beach and cove, um, right next to Paynton Harbour. And uh, what you got here is, it's actually low shore, but there is basically no middle shore at uh, this, this site. Um, I just noticed like this mixed ecology here. So you got this, you got the, the green over uh, seaweed. If you look at the top of the screen here, these, this black area is actually black, black tar lichen. So you got the lichens here, you got the alga there. And again, you got the, you got the blue green uh, bacteria here a big mass of it. Um, <clears throat> right next to it, actually, there was a freshwater stream coming down the cliff. So that probably accounted for why it was growing here, actually. So I, I, I really kind of find that interesting. So lichen, alga, and bacteria all in one area. So, 
So this has taken a couple of years to get me for Beach in Torbay. Um, it just caught my eye because it was the fur below was hold fast and it was absolutely covered in these really beautiful um, flat um, top shells or purple top shells. Uh, we, this is actually quite a common species at this particular um, site actually. And yeah, I just noticed lots and lots of them just uh, grazing over these, these furbelows, hold fast. And it just made such a nice contrasting color scheme um, and structure for the picture. Um, yeah, really beautiful top shells. And I include this one uh, because this is basically the largest um, chitin or chitin I've ever found. Um, so this is at Wembury about two years ago. Um, I don't get there very often, I should do, it's a very special site. <clears throat> and um, I photographed this because this is a, this is a gray, uh, a gray chitin, which is by far the most common species we find. Uh, but for, just to show you, uh, this is my trusty barnacle um, um, transect. Um, um, and so this is three centimeters, three centimeters square. So, uh, so basically, this 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 chitin chitin was actually three centimeters long, just about. I, I've never seen one so large since. So it was quite an incredible animal. So I, I just took that as a curiosity, actually. But it, it makes an interesting image, I think. Moving swiftly on, back to Corbin Head, and I don't know if you've seen this around your area. Uh, it's not a particularly common uh, um, seaweed. It actually is a seaweed. It's Padonna, but um, Padina pavonica, which actually um, I've forgotten the common name. Isn't it? It's a mental block. It's a very common species in the in the in the Mediterranean, but in this country you only find it in a few sites around Dorset, I believe. I think you can find it in some parts of Cornwall, and I've, it's the only place I found it in Devon, actually. Um, there was a site nearby Corbin Head, I found it. The reason I included it was I first found it a couple of years ago, and this was taken back in July, actually, when I was out with Warren in July, and um, I was really pleased to see it. It kind of greatly um, increased its abundance. I found quite large patches of it on the low shore, so that was a really nice thing to see. It's a really, really beautiful thing to photograph underwater. Um, uh, I was just so happy that it, it kind of was increasing, so that was nice. Okay, uh, this is slightly off topic here, but this is actually very near where I live in Newton Abbott. Um, so this is uh, Newton Abbott Town Quay, and this isn't strictly marine, but the reason I've included it is because I do spend a bit of time, because it's quite close to where I live, potting around this area, looking at species. And, and the interesting thing about it, as you notice, it's tidal. Um, and so you've got a real mixture of freshwater species and marine species. Uh, you do find crabs here. You find a lot of freshwater species. Um, I found um, Jenkins um, spire shell, which is a non-native freshwater um, shell, tiny little black shells, thousands of them here actually. Um, so it's a mixture of marine and fresh water, which I, I personally find very interesting. This is the uh, main line here, which get, so this is Newtown Abbott Station is just to the left of this picture, very close by. This is the main line to, to London. Um, but it, it, in terms of ecology, it's a very interesting place. I mean, it is tidal, the water here is quite low salinity. But you you do get uh, you do get uh, flounders coming up here. You you get bass coming up here. And interestingly, I've seen quite a few carp as well, freshwater carp swimming around here. And you get like mullet up here. You get other freshwater fish species. So I just love that. Um, I just love that combination of fresh and seawater together uh, in terms of cre creating a mixed ecology. And I've taken this site on some under some plastic sheet is amphipods. I won't, I won't actually try and identify them because I'll probably get it wrong because I think amphipods are extremely difficult to identify unless you're an expert. But I, I thought it made quite an interesting image on black plastic. I think they're rather stunning actually. Um, okay, coming to the end. 
Um, so this was actually back in August. Um, this is uh, this is Goodrington Beach, um, South End. Uh, it, I went there because it was a very low tide, and you've got a long beach, and then it goes up to the north end of Goodrington Beach, which I showed you earlier, which is a, rock, a fantastic rocky shore. So you've got a fantastic mixture of ecology. So I took this picture while I was sitting just uh, above here, um, eating some chips and having a cup of tea and looking down below and I saw all these lovely clear pools. I thought, hmm, I'm, I think it's worth looking in there. And, and I looked in there and the first thing I saw was this crab sticking out in the sand. Now, you, some of you may have found this up in, up in North Devon because you have a lot of sandy beaches. This is actually Pennant's pennant swimming crab and I saw this guy sticking out of the sand and I, I have to say I scooped it out and I put it into my specimen pot and took some pictures and then I put it back into the water in the same pool where it just kind of laid there on, on top of the sand and I managed to get some nice underwater pictures of it basically. Uh, this, this is a species that I actually haven't found before so I was quite pleased about that. Uh, as you may, may agree, it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting crab actually. Uh, you can tell it's a uh, swimming crab because on the back legs here, you can see the um, the hairs that enables it to um, to swim a lot better. Uh, it, it, after I took this picture, it buried itself back into the sand again, disappeared. But uh, yeah, it was a really nice find. If I literally looked into the first pool I came to and I found it, so that was quite cool. Um, finish you off now. Uh, so this is a place that Toby would recognise. It's at Dawlish Warren. Um, uh, I took this. Uh, I th yeah, I took this. Um, I think it was a begin in spring. I think what happened was I was getting the train up to Exeter to go to go and meet a friend. And when I when I, I don't know, I just noticed that the tide was going to be quite low as I was passing through Dawlish Warren. So I thought, ooh, okay, I'll take my camera. I'll get off the train for an hour then skirt around on the shore and then I'll go back up to Exeter. And I did that and I'm glad I did it because um, I found this crawling, th moving through a, a, rock, a shallow pool. So I imagine you find it on your sandy beaches up your way, I don't know. Uh, so there's a necklace shell, um, uh, Euspira canata, which actually around aren't my way here in Paynton and Torbay, it's a very common species, subtitly. Uh, normally you find piles and piles of their empty shells. Um, you don't often see a live one uh, kind of moving around. And I was very fortunate to see this one in a shallow pool. And it's got its huge, um, it's got its huge mantle here extended to move around on the pool. Uh, a really beautiful mollusk, I think. So I, I felt, I've seen one or two since uh, doing this, but you don't often see them with a fully extended mantle. So. Uh, I thought I include that. It was a, a nice thing because I didn't really plan to to do a short trip. It was just a spur of the moment um, thing, and I found this. Uh, it was nice. Okay, that's it. Um, so just a quick plug here for the shores of South Devon. Um, this is our Facebook page here, uh, page. In case you, if you haven't seen it before, uh, please have a look. I also have my own uh, page, Mike's Marine Magic, uh, which I haven't actually updated for a little while now, um, but it's, it's a collection of uh, some of my marine images. And uh, about two months ago, I started another Facebook group, uh, Northeast, Northeast Atlantic Cyropedia, um, to, to showcase uh, various barnacle finds, um, and that's going quite well. And uh, here we have our website address for the Shores of South Devon, shoresofdevon.org, if you want to have a look at some point. And I'll give credit to Toby here for doing fantastic work on setting up the website and maintaining it. So just to finish off right now, uh, my, my inspiration, you know, for, for uh, just loving the shore, um, I think it's me, and I, I'm sure it's the same with all of you to, uh, uh, coming here this morning. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's encapsulated by these, by these words from uh, Rachel Carson, who was the most wonderful um, writer, um, poet, and marine biologist. Uh, she sadly died at the beginning of the 60s, but 
Um, I just think this this quote, uh, uh, the edge of the sea is a strange and beautiful place, is, is very inspirational. And I put the slide together for another talk, but in the background here is Berry Head, and this is an empty looking tour bay on a, on a, on a dark evening. So that is my final inspiration. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, I try to make it as very as possible. So um, thanks for uh, having a look this morning. So thanks very much. I would be uh, coming this morning. Thank you very much, Mike. That was a wonderful talk.